This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Hey, welcome to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. I'm delighted to have on the show today two guests, Rabbi Jeremy Kagan and Jeffrey Bloom. And we're going to talk about a collection of essays that edited by Jeff Bloom, Alec Goldstein, and Gil Student called Strauss, Spinoza, and Sinai, Orthodox Judaism and Modern Questions of Faith. And this, I think, is a really interesting and relevant topic for all people who are believers. So let me just give you a quick a, a bio. Rabbi Jeremy Kagan was born in Boston and raised in Hawaii. He uh, studied at Yale University, stud- intending to study math and physics. Um, but after traveling, traveling in Israel and exposed to Torah, he switched his major, graduating with a BA in philosophy. He is a teacher and a rabbi, and he's written a number of books, including The Jewish Self, Recovering Spirituality in the Modern World. And in 2011, he published The Choice to Be a Jewish Path to Self and Spirituality. He was awarded the National Jewish Book Award for Modern Jewish Thought. His third book is The Intellect and Exodus, Authentic Emunah for a Complex Age. And Emunah is faith, is that correct, in in Hebrew, right? And then the editor... uh, Jeffrey Bloom is a graduate of the University of Chicago. After college, he studied a number of Orthodox uh, yeshivas in Israel, and now he lives with his wife and his family in New Jersey. So both of you, thank you very much for joining the, the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Jeff, maybe we can start with you as the editor, because part of this is your personal story, right? You tell the story of how you studied under uh, Dr. Leon Cass and began to engage questions of Strauss and belief, and this became... This, book is really a result of a long kind of personal story for you. Could you tell us a little sure. bit about the, sure. your story and, and the book? Sure. So I grew up um, in the suburbs of Chicago in, in a Jewish family that was, you know, secular. We didn't have any particularly strong religious or non-religious Jewish commitments. I went to University of Chicago, where, as you said, I had the chance to study with uh, Leon Cass. In a few classes with him, the most important for me was really a seminar that he gave on Genesis, which for me was really, as I, you know, it was really the first time I had seen, a, you know, religion taken, Judaism taken seriously, any religion taken seriously, Judaism in particular, as we're reading the book of Genesis um, with him. But in college, I didn't, you know, go to, and I didn't do anything particularly Jewish. Other beyond that, after college, I worked in Washington, D.C. for a year. And during that year, I started going to synagogue really for social reasons, you know, to be, you know, to meet people. If we're candid, maybe those people would be women more than men. <laughs> those are people I would more want, have wanted to meet at that time of my life. And um, very reasonable, very reasonable. <laughs> you know, and um, I started exploring Orthodox Judaism, and I was attracted to it emotionally. And I'll be blunt, I'll be honest about the reason that I was attracted to it. My parents were divorced when I was a child, when I was five years old. I spent, you know, I say they were good at being divorced. Uh, I, I saw my, I spent weekends with my father, but had a kind of, you know, Generation X divorced parents childhood. You know, I think there's a lot of kind of, a lot of people have some version of that. And I had some version of that. So when I first was exposed to Orthodox Jewish family life in the form of spending the Sabbath with Orthodox Jewish families, it rang just a very, very deep bell with me. It resonated very deeply. And so I had my nose kind of pressed to the window of this world of Orthodox Judaism that I was interested in. And I, during that year after college, I read an essay by Leo Strauss. So Leo Strauss was a well-known figure at the University of Chicago where he taught for many years. And he's a, you know, a, an important figure in modern philosophy, modern Jewish philosophy, and political philosophy, whatever category you want to put him in. And I read it. He wrote he wrote a book as a young man in 1930 about Spinoza called Spinoza's Critique of Religion. The book was later translated and republished, I think, in 1965. He added a preface to it, which is a sort of tour de force of his own his own the evolution of his own thinking and uh, fundamental themes in modern Jewish philosophy. And in the midst of this 
dense essay, which I, we we're not going to recapitulate here and wouldn't even be able to recapitulate here well because it's a, you really need almost a specialist to unpack it. But one thing I got out of it when I read it post-college was an argument that he makes there. He basically puts forward the contention that the Enlightenment, you know, starting with Spinoza and his heirs, you know, while they may have claimed to have sort of decisively refuted orthodoxy, they did not. And, you know, he goes so far as to say that they kind of knew it. He implies they kind of knew it. And that the real, the for all intents and purposes, he suggests you might think it might be that their mockery of orthodoxy was actually their, their refutation. They sort of laughed orthodoxy out of the room. But when you really sort of step back, Strauss says, and look at the arguments, he's not convinced that they really refuted orthodoxy or even laid a hand on it if orthodoxy is willing to make a certain concession. And the concession that he wants orthodoxy to make is that whereas in the past orthodoxy might have claimed to know that the tenets of its views are the truth, he thinks that is not going to be tenable. But if orthodoxy is willing to say that it merely believes the tenets of its, you know, religion it's of, of of Judaism, then it's it's on firmer ground because it's essentially, you know, each system of thought, each interpretation of the world, each interpretation of of the Bible, rests on sort of unprovable, unknowable premises. But those premises themselves one cannot decisively refute the other. So, you know, a person who's, if you are presented with the text of the Bible and, you know, one interpretation of the Bible will look at it as essentially a human document and explain how it's been pieced together by various authors representing various agendas in ancient Israel and another, the sort of the traditional Jewish Orthodox interpretation, will explain very, the same the same data, the same data points, the same facts. Will get a different interpretation from within the tradition, and a a a, a, a contradiction or a textual piece of evidence that in the hands of a Bible critic who's making one set of assumptions will be interpreted as a meaningful communication of God to man in the hands of the tradition. So what I found myself, what this argument did for me personally coming out of college at this stage of my life is it made Orthodox Judaism at least intellectually plausible, which is a big deal because it's something that prior to that, I had never even considered part of the conversation. It wasn't even something that I, it wasn't as if before that I sort of thought, oh, there's my secular Jewish life and there's Orthodox Judaism. It was just, there's just my secular Jewish life. And I never even thought that Orthodox Judaism was even an intellectual possibility. And I think one of the things that Wherever one stands on Strauss's intellectual legacy, which is complex and is argued um, about by people who are much more knowledgeable about it than I am, one thing I, I think that Strauss does very well, and I found him personally very valuable for, is able to, there are possibilities that are so buried in our world, and he's able to sort of dust them off and make them, you know, bring out the plausibility of buried possibilities. So for me, where this left me coming out of college was, you know, I might, so again, I've got my nose pressed to the window of orthodoxy. I've got, now got Strauss making it intellectually plausible. I essentially decide to become orthodox. I go off to yeshiva in Israel and study for a number of years. And while I'm there, one of the questions that I'm posing to my teachers is essentially, you know, this argument that Strauss makes 
you know, to defend orthodoxy against the claims of Spinoza and the Enlightenment. You know, Strauss, whatever his merits, he was not an orthodox Jew. He was knowledgeable, but he was not, you know, there's parts of the Jewish tradition where he was very knowledgeable, you know, the philosophical part of the tradition, Maimonides, you know, but he was he was not um, versed in the whole range of the Talmud, what is considered the part of the Judaism called the oral law. So I was asking my Orthodox Jewish teachers, these scholars, uh, among them Rabbi Kagan, you know, this argument that Strauss advances to defend Orthodoxy against the claims of the Enlightenment, is this what we believe? Is this our best argument? Or is this a, is it an, orth, you know, Strauss, well, he's not Orthodox. Is the, is the, do we have a better argument? Is essentially, is our strategy, the, our intellectual strategy, to be a thinking, thoughtful, rational, orthodox Jew in the 20th century, are we essentially, do we have anything better to say on that than, than Leo Strauss? Or is Strauss sort of, what he's got there is as good as it gets. And just, so I spent a number of years in yeshiva. You know, I talk about this question with with a number of people. I, I, I sort of, the question gets refined, advanced, Somewhat here and there, I moved back to the United States. I, I have a job, I have a family, you know, ongoing intellectual Jewish interests. And I come across an essay by someone named Thomas Merrill, who is a, another student of Leon Cass's. He's a professor at American University. He has an essay where he's unpacking the Strauss preface to Spinoza. And in the midst of this Thomas Merrill commentary, essentially, on the Strauss essay, he makes a point that really set off a that really was the sort of spark to, to the, for the book for the collection that we're talking about here. Thomas Merrill points out that in the midst of in the in this whole essay, Strauss never asks Orthodox Jews what they think. He says that you know Orthodoxy is a silent interlocutor. Strauss uses Orthodoxy to sort of probe the premises of the Enlightenment, but he never really talks to orthodoxy and says, well, what do you think? And when I read that, I said, well, wait a second. That's what I was doing, you know, 20 years ago in yeshiva. That's exactly what I was doing. I was trying to get my hands on the best and brightest orthodox Jews I could find at the time and ask them, was this, is, is this what we believe? And when I saw that Thomas Merrill made that argument, I realized that I could, in theory, go out to the best and brightest Orthodox Jews I could get my hands on today and pose the questions to them anew and see what they thought. And I had the blessing, really, to the first person that I posed the question to became one of the co-editors, Rabbi Gill's student. It resonated with him off the bat. He introduced me to Alec Goldstein, who became the second co-editor, and Alec r- runs a s- small but, um, I think, a publishing house that kind of punches above its weight in the Jewish world called Kodesh Press that is p- publishing books that are kind of on the seam between r- you know rabbinics and the academy as this book kind of sits. And he, between the two of us, we had a Rolodex or we had the ability to reach out to a number of, you know, thinkers. Not everyone had time. Not everyone could do it. Not everyone was interested. Not everyone thought it was a good topic. But we found, you know, besides their two essays, another 15 serious thinkers who were willing to take the time to weigh in on this. And, and that those essays are collected in Strauss, Spinoza, and Sinai, the book that we, and one of the essays is from one of my former teachers or as former and ongoing, it it's, continues to be a teacher, Rabbi Jeremy Kagan, who we have on the podcast with us today. So that's the, the long winded version of how we got here. You no, know, it's good. Thank you for that. Because I think it's, I think a couple things come, come up and we'll, we'll go into some of um, Rabbi Kagan's arguments and more of the arguments, but tell me if I'm getting kind of a summary correct here that in one sense, there's this, there's a sense broadly that the enlightenment and science and empiricist rationalism has proved that religion, orthodox religion, and in specifically in, in this case, Orthodox Judaism, but I would say Orthodox Catholicism, is intellectually unserious and untenable. And that many people hold that to be the case. Like, okay, just like the, we've 
we haven't we haven't we done away with all of the superstition like to use Kant's language we're going to grow up and get rid of the superstition and what Strauss says is look you you say that the enlightenment has solved the problems but there are actually a priori's for the enlightenment that you also accept on belief right and so we'll get in that in a second and then so therefore and i guess there's two things ways to say it one is both orthodox judaism and say spinoza's enlightenment commitments rest upon a priori's that you can't prove and so if you're allowed to believe in the light in the enlightenment with quotes, believe in the enlightenment, you're allowed to believe in Orthodox Judaism and then they're plausible. So I, I guess that seems to me though, like in one sense that holds, right? Is that what made Orthodox Judaism plausible that the enlightenment too rested upon a priori of faith for you, Jeff? Yes, it did. Your restatement of it is very nice. I think, I think that the big thing is, Judaism for me, Orthodox Judaism for me, had to go from, you know, a non-possibility to a possibility. So then Strauss, this argument that you just re recapitulated, recapitulated so nicely, essentially now puts them kind of even. We at least got them, you know, you know, somewhat even. Although, although I would say, and someone said, someone. One of the essays in the book actually points this out, and I think Robbie Kagan's essay touches on this as well. And a friend to, to after the, I published the, the 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 book, you know, it's very interesting. Once you put the book out into the world, you get feedback, and it was some very good feedback I got from a, a friend of mine who's an Orthodox Jew and well read in philosophy. Said, you know, did you find Rabbi Shalom Carmi's essay offensive to you? One of, the, one of the essays in the book, were you personally offended by it? And, you know, I said no, and I went back and reread it, and I saw what he, his point was what Rabbi Shalom Karmi says in his essay is he just doesn't understand why anyone would find this argument compelling in the least bit. Strauss, what he puts on the table for, for as orthodoxy is so thin, essentially, you know, that why would this be a compelling argument to anyone in the in the first place? Like, like, like Karmi... Rabbi Carmi starts out and says, before we get to whether this is an Orthodox Jewish argument, let's just see if it's a good argument at all. And he finds it quite lacking. And I think that my, my answer to my friend essentially is, is that, you know, all I needed from Strauss was to put Orthodoxy in the conversation. Right. Um, and, you know, then from there, you know, I built – you know, sort of whatever kind of orthodox thought structure I built was sort of, um, you know, you know, that was like step one, not step 10. So I think maybe, it, um, how would I say this? I think in one sense, okay, Shalom Karmi's argument is right. Like, it's not a very good argument. Like there's certain, I mean, there's certain parts of it that I think are good. There's certain, like, but if you start to like really dive in, there are some problems. And I think there's even some problems with um, this separation of belief you know as long as we it, it almost oh, it opens the door to faith being simply this kind of subjective thing in the bit in your brain and you know you can believe in yellow and you can believe in orthodox judaism and you can believe in science and we're all just you know living with our little bits in our brain i think that's a deep problem of subjectivity and i think that's one of the ways but if i'm understanding what you experienced that and why you wouldn't be offended by uh, uh, Shalom Karmi's uh, art, which I thought actually was a, was a pretty, I actually, there's a couple of sections in that essay that I want to talk about a little bit because sure. I think he, he kind of, he, he, there's this kind of like a reduction. Now, obviously I'm Orthodox Catholic, so I'm here dealing, I'm not a Straussian and I'm an Orthodox <laughs> Catholic and I'm talking about Orthodox Judaism and Straussian. I mean, talk about danger zone. Okay. I mean, no Top Gun pilot had to go through this. Okay. So, <laughs> but it seems to me like some of the ways that, Orthodox Judaism is understood as like, oh, it's just this legalistic thing, you know, like it doesn't understand love and deep relationship with the living God. I mean, like it's just kind of very, kind of very simple, but let's bracket that and we can talk about those problems. But it seems to me, if I'm understanding and why, in a sense, the Strauss is the beginning. And I liked how you said it, Jeff, Strauss didn't get you to become a practicing, observant Orthodox Jew in deep relationship with God in the community. That was... Rabbi Kagan and others, right? Right. What Strauss got you to do is say, oh, wait a minute. 
what I thought was a closed door, shut down argument that the Enlightenment has just destroyed religion is just actually mockery. It's not serious. And that this appearance of scientific power and, you know, kind of empiricist trash, it's just incoherent on its own terms. Because you can't demonstrate empirically, for example, that empiricism is right. Why is reason better than non-reason? Why is science better than non-science? Why is truth better than non-truth? And yet, all these things, in a sense, Spinoza holds. So that opens up the door to say, oh, maybe the world is deeper and more embedded. Is that? Am I getting that? Can I can I interrupt for a moment? Please, yeah, jump in. So I just um, just in terms of uh, in terms of uh, setting up what we might what I would call Western rational thought versus uh, a faith based system. I don't know exactly how you want to phrase it. The word that I would use is premises. And yeah, the premise is a priori by definition, but I think uh, what you need to be aware of and where the confidence that the Western tradition brings to uh, the legitimacy of its approach is that it's based on, I mean, there are two components to it. One is empiricism, meaning observation. Uh, There are things that we can look at and that we can see we can do experiments to determine if our way of looking at it is correct or it's not correct. That would be the scientific component and the power of rationality as a way to kind of develop an idea with uh, some uh, compelling logic and structure to it. When Strauss in this essay sort of makes this space for faith within a a Western tradition, I think the point that you were making, Michael, is an important one, that it really comes, it's pretty weak in the sense that it's really like a sort of a second class approach in the sense that he talks about something that you can produce with reason as having a compelling logic to it, whereas faith, again, we can talk about where there are shortcomings in his understanding what faith is really all about, But certainly uh, from a Western perspective, when a person, usually when you have these things being debated, there are people that are quite ignorant of what faith really means and where it comes from. It doesn't have a compelling structure to it. It is true that uh, each one has its own premises, but the Western tradition will want to take as evidence for its superiority or for its truth factor, really, is the fact that it's based on, let's just, you know, have a cup of coffee and take a look. And isn't, don't we see that this is in fact the way things work? You have to bear that in mind when you're having this conversation. If you want this conversation to speak to people that aren't coming and sharing your premises that sort of go to that faith based system, you need to bring into the awareness that evidence, if you want to put it that way, the evidence moves towards this Western rational vision. Again, when you're talking about Orthodox, I assume that it. I mean, the, the Catholic faith also looks at the Jewish Bible as a significant foundation. You have events being described there that uh, miracles, uh, which uh, really someone schooled in the Western tradition effectively rejects their possibility. So it's. Uh, I mean, again, this may be part a more advanced part of the discussion in terms of exactly how it is we understand that these things how it is that we understand that the world described in the Bible is so different from the world as we actually experience it. But you do need to address that before you're going to be able to set up the systems and look at them as as, as if these are two equal systems with different Mm -hmm. premises. So maybe, could you go into that a little bit? Maybe we're jumping ahead, but I think from thinking for listeners for a second, because like most of the listeners probably haven't read this book. (laughs) So let's pause for a second and then we're going to go right back into what you're talking about, Rabbi Kagan. And, um, and correct me at any point if I've got, I've got this wrong, but you've got, so I think the reason this book matters and the reason that, that this argument matters is as Jeff said, existentially, like we can talk about all the debates of like Western rationalism and this, but at one kind of core element, there are just millions of people who don't even consider the possibility or the plausibility of Orthodox religion. Okay. We'll call it. And I, and what I mean, and let's be, let's be Absolutely. simple. Okay. We're going to like, we're going to be all, uh, you know, for our own teams here. And that is, we're going to talk about what I'll call Orthodox Judaism, Catholicism, and well, I guess we include Eastern Orthodoxy, and I guess Protestants, but especially 
Orthodox Judaism, Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy, which are both Hebrew and Islam. I mean, you've got Islam. I mean, really any faith-based system. Maybe you want. We, we, I don't know if we want to restrict it to monotheism, yeah, but well, that would be yeah, another we can talk about that. Already. But let's restrict it specifically to monotheism and also monotheism that that takes both. Because if you take the reason, I think I want to focus on Catholicism and Orthodox Judaism is one is because that's where the three of us are. Right. Two, I can speak about Orthodoxy, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, a bit as well because there's so many similarities. But also, those traditions take reason very seriously. They take reason and reason thinking seriously. So, like you know, that I think is also part of the element. There's, it's not. I think this is what maybe bothers people about the Straussian point. Like, okay, you can have your little subjective, you know, fairyland. Of Orthodox Judaism and you know believe in the Exodus, okay. But as long as that doesn't infect you know affect or uh, involve uh, anything having to do with reality, then we're okay. And and I think that as a Catholic, and I would assume as an Orthodox Jew, you're like, no, actually, I won't limit my belief to simply the subjective bit in my brain. So I, I think this is maybe why we'll focus there, if that's okay, on these areas. And so that w- the question is. Why it, this matters is it? It's the first step at breaking apart, in a sense, the scientific proof that religion no longer is needed. That's where I think that that matters. Is am I getting it right? Is it why it mattered to you, Jeff? That's the first step. It's not the solution. It's not the answer. It's the first step. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I say in my introduction that it, you know, and I'm being, you know, uh, arch by saying that it broke the spell because there's, there's a famous book yeah. breaking the spell by by Dana, which is a, a case for atheism but i'm saying you know the, the you know strauss broke the spell of of a sort of you know assumed atheism because I, I think w- w- what your point out what rabbi kagan's pointing out is that the premises and not just the premises but sort of the lived experience of what comes out of the premises of, of the enlightenment just seems to us absolutely self-evident and undeniable and it's so powerful that you know i'm not i'm not i'm not who i'm not disagreeing with rabbi Carmi. i'm just saying that i think that you know his perspective underestimates what a milestone it is just to put orthodox judaism into the conversation for someone who just couldn't even imagine you know if you'd asked me when i was 20 years old and a sophomore in college, whatever I was, you know, someday would you be like 50 years old and an Orthodox Jew? I'd be like, yeah, yeah I mean, I could also be on Mars, you know? So yeah, it just wouldn't be something I didn't even thought about. So yeah. So yes. I mean, I think that's yeah. the Okay. The so I think that's the, and I think that the reason I think that just to stress that is it's because now we're like, okay, now the door's open. Now let's actually start to go into the premises that Rabbi Kagan and some of the other writers talk about. And like, before I go to that, there's another one thing that kind of struck me, and maybe you could help me understand this better. But as I was reading it, I, there was a sense that, I'm not quoting here, so again, feel free to correct anything if I've made an error. But it seems that one of the ways you're looking at philosophy, and that Strauss and Spinoza, but especially Strauss looking at philosophy, is that either f- that revelation is a threat to philosophy. So the philosophical man is going to try to solve and understand the the the, like said, the problem of man, the problem of humanity, the problem or live, et cetera. He's going to understand that with with reason alone. And if if revelation is needed over reason alone, that somehow is a threat to the philosophical mind. So that the responsibility of philosophy is to destroy and disprove revelation. And that seems to be the one argument. But I, I would say, and maybe here's where I align with the Shalom Karmi a little bit, or one, like I just don't think that's a very good definition of philosophy. I think that is a definition of philosophy, but I think it's a poor definition of philosophy. A better definition of philosophy, related to the words philosophos, love of wisdom, is that we're open to reality. And if you're open to reality, then it may be very well the case that there's a God who made this reality that's going to reveal himself to you. And that philosophical sense would be an alignment there. And then there's even maybe a deeper embedded level is like, why do we wonder and do we think philosophy is good in the first place? Like what, that there are these kind of under like layers of embeddedness that we're just taking for granted. And I think, so that seems to be the, almost like an error in the way we, we set out philosophy that's related to the error of making, of saying the enlightenment gets rid of, of the possibility of Orthodox uh, Judaism 
also it just seems to like miss the or kind of close us off to the deeper possibility that there could be a connection between faith and reason and that that you don't have to have this Straussian separation that either you have, you know, that that these two belief systems can never touch each other. What do you think about that? Do you think that's wrong, incorrect, or, or how would you comment? Maybe Rabbi Kagan, you want to you want to take a shot at that? I think no one would argue that one can think philosophically within a religious context, but I think where Strauss is coming from is if you see yourself as a member of the liberal, rational, Western worldview of the modern world, then, um, you know, sort of reminds me if you, someone who knows science really well will tell you that science is effectively a game, meaning what? Meaning there are rules, right? Science doesn't have the capability of telling you the nature of reality, but it can view reality through a lens of a purely physical existence, measuring things physically. A thoughtful scientist will tell you, science tells you nothing about the nature of reality, but rather it tells us how we can view the world as a completely physical space. A not sophisticated scientist will misunderstand and conflate what science comes up with, with reality itself. The reason why we're having this discussion here is in the context of Western liberalism at this point, uh, we could similarly say that philosophy is a game in the sense that it has certain rules. Is revelation possible? Yeah, but once you get into revelation, you're in a different game. No one's saying that revelation isn't uh, on a certain level legitimate, but it isn't doesn't have a place in the game of uh, Western philosophy, which is an effort to understand the world effectively through reason. And now, you know, since the dawning of the scientific revolution, a combination of observation and rationalism, and basically this is all an inheritance from the Greek origins of sort of the, the, as a Catholic, you'll know that the whole Western tradition, if you go back uh, six or 700 years, was completely inseparable from faith. You couldn't separate the two. And really all philosophy was done within the context of Christian thinking. But what the reason why this becomes a discussion now with Strauss or Spinoza is uh, we find ourselves now in what we would call modern or postmodern, whatever. But even starting from the modern world already, the re- beginning with the Renaissance was a separation of these two in an effort to understand the world purely through a combination of observation and uh, rational development, at which point revelation simply doesn't have a place in the conversation. But then again, that be- when that becomes conflated with reality, which we very, again, as Jeff was pointing out now, intuitively, we identify these two. Observation, we've been trained to relate to the world as a physical place. We accept our observation and we've been trained in rationality where it's not just philosophy isn't just a game, but we conflate that game with reality itself. And we actually don't really leave space for anything else to come in there. In terms of as a religious person, can you think philosophically? Absolutely. But that doesn't really... It's not always relevant to Strauss's discussion on Spinoza, where he's really talking about the modern Western intellectual tradition, which presents itself as a purely rational observational one versus revelation, which is going to be a completely different thing. And then the legitimacy of revelation requires me to have different prem- a priori premises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very, that's very helpful. Let's now go back to what you were talking about before. Like there's just the kind of, a, a, when we think about faith or reason, and you say that there's a different mode of understanding. Could you go through that? Um, what is it? Well, I think it's important to discuss. What What do we mean by faith? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, I guess within the, I mean, a lot of different people would have a lot of different things to say on that. I'm, I'm going to take a particular line on it, which is that, I mean, obviously faith m- means I am understanding the world within the context of an awareness of the fact that there is a basis to that reality. And in fact, that basis to that reality is more real than anything that I have any direct access to. Where do I have access to an actual uh, an faith or knowledge or whatever you want to call it of the existence of that entity? So, if you go back a thousand years, then people would actually mount rational arguments to at least justify it. But really, I think within the Jewish tradition, the whole point is any engagement of being 
opens me to the awareness of the fact that there is some basis to existence that I'm trying to engage and connect to. And the whole point here is there, this then creates a very, very different path to engaging this deeper truth, which we would call faith, which is instead of using my intellect to analyze the world that I have access to, I'm actually trying to subjectively engage the level of being, which I have access through my own individual existence, and use that as a window to connect to something which transcends my own individual existence. That was a mouthful. Should I try again? No, no. so, okay, so you talked, oh, go ahead, Jeff. You want to no, I, I, as someone who, you yeah. know, has, I just, I think Rory Kagan, would I, can you unpack what you, your starting point for this discussion is our experience mm-hmm. of being. Can you flesh out, I just, as for me, as, as a student of yours, as someone who's read your essay in this book and your, and your, and your other books, it's a term you use a lot and maybe you just flesh out what you mean by it. I mean, the, uh, the sages would tell us that we've actually, we are in a, a mode where we are actually completely oblivious to our own existence. We're so busy looking at the world around us and understanding the world around us. I, my favorite example of this is the beginning of modern philosophy is really Descartes who says, I think, therefore I am. So I, I remember finding this a very, very powerful, you know, uh, logical trope, whatever you want to call it, when I was in my younger years. But in, in my later years, I actually look at it as kind of dysfunctional, that a person would say, I th- need to prove intellectually their own existence, meaning I'm going to separate out from who I am and analyze myself through my intellect to know if I actually exist. I compare it to like if I to trying to figure out how beautiful a mountain is by looking at a photograph of the mountain. It's like why would you step out of who you are to try and prove that you exist? It's like it's a, but that's the basically the, the modern the west engages reality first and foremost through the intellect. Faith engages reality first and foremost through the experience of being. So maybe let's let's um talk about that because I think you said a couple of different elements that are important. You say the Western tradition, the modern Western tradition, it goes through the intellect, but it, it is in a sense an it's a how do you say it? it's an intellect that's both reductionist, but that also has its premises, right? That I'm trying to think about how to say this, but so I've talked about this on the podcast before um, with Jim Madden and with other with other people about the fact that we're we're embodied, embedded creatures, beings, okay, and that. This I think talks about this engage. There's an engaging with being, all right. And there's maybe a couple of ways we can go. So I want to talk about like the concept of like how even say the Jewish and Catholic understanding that being is good, that it's created, that the world is de-divinized. It's not right. It's good, but it's not divine. And that being is good. I think is a in a sense. I mean, how do you say it? It's so deeply embedded and like part of the way you operate, it's not something that you're thinking articulately. Okay. So that's, and so I'm going to pause that for a second and go to that being question a second, because I want to ask engagement. But there's another thing that you bring up a little bit in your essay, Rabbi Kagan, which is like, in a sense, different kinds of knowing there's like intuition. So I don't know if you're familiar with the book by um, Carl Stern called Flight from Woman. Stern is a very interesting character. He makes a distinction. One of his chapters is on the difference between scientific knowledge and poetic knowledge. And he says that there's a couple of points. I'm trying to get this out quickly because there's so much in that in this book. But that in scientific knowledge, right, is one kind of knowing. But there's also what you could be called con-natural or poetic knowledge that comes intuitively. And the part of the problem, it seems, is that what you're calling the Western rationalist tradition in its intellectual approach is that it's actually not paying attention to or purposefully refusing to address all the pre-layers of embedded intuitive knowledge that I think could be aligned with this understanding of like you engage with being. So that's why you get this kind of, as you said, strange kind of weird thing like I think therefore I am. Well, maybe you are and that's why you're thinking. Right, that there's this intuition. How could you? I mean, I, I'm throwing out a lot there, right? But this difference between poetic 
knowledge and scientific knowledge that scientific knowledge has a very important place. It's that no one, I think, no, we're not, no one here is denying the importance of scientific knowledge or empirical knowledge. But empiricism it can't, it's incoherent on its own terms. You, you can't, it's not, there's no empirical evidence to show you that empirical knowledge is good. You're relying on something before it. There's some kind of like con natural or what you'd call like an engaging with being. I don't know if you want to comment on that or refer to that, but you dress this like modes of knowledge that I think is really important. And I think this goes back, this is what Strauss opens us up to beginning to think about. As you say, Jeff, maybe the answers of Strauss's answers aren't great, but he opens up the questions to ask all these questions of like, how do we engage being? I'm not sure. I, I, there was a lot there, but how do you, do you want to comment on that? React, disagree? What do you think? I would phrase it to you like this, that, um, I mean, and you see this uh, developing in its most extreme fashion, really in our own times, but the knowing something actually means knowing what it does. Mm. So instrumental That reason. I would say is a, a way that, what does it do? How does it function, right? How does it act? How does it react? That means knowing the thing. What you're calling intuitive knowledge is asking what is it as opposed to what does it do? Or another, on a faith level, you would ask the question, what is its purpose? Why does this exist? As opposed to what does it do in the context of existence, right? The sci I, 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 what we might call that scientific mode of understanding the world really is satisfied to know what something does and never really even ask the question, what is it? Because it's, uh, you know, it's uh, the whole way of trying to engage that question is very, very different. And it's the reason why I mentioned before that that the sages talk about the fact that to a certain extent, we've forgotten that we exist because we're so busy looking at the world. So we forget to ask this question, what is it? Because we have we are oblivious to the fact that we ourselves exist and we're really relating to ourselves as we function in the world. What do we want? What, I need, what do I need to do to get what I want? You know, how's the world around me acting? I mean, obviously, you know, art, Art is something which would be something would be worth bringing into the discussion. Also, that would complicate it a little bit now. But it's um, the only thing that we know what it is is ourselves. Basically, everything else we only know from the outside. How does it appear to me? The only thing that you know what it is, because the only thing that you are is yourself. If you never even think about that or engage that or aware or conscious of that, then it doesn't even occur to you that, that to ask or what are other things. But if you want to know what other things are, and certainly you first have to come to know yourself. And once you know yourself on a deep level, then you can start sort of asking questions about, you know, how I extrapolate to what from what I what I know myself to be what to what other things are. But it's not I wouldn't call it exactly it's not it's not merely a subjective knowledge because uh, there's a process to winnow out to get clarity on 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 that experience rather than being distracted by things that you aren't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think to back to the earlier part of your point, I think that this is in one sense, one of the, it's the focus on the instrumental, on the efficient cause. So if you take Aristotelian causality, right, you have four causes, the material, formal, efficient, and, and um, final, and the formal cause, but also the final cause, the purpose has been left out in modern, in modern life. So I think you're, it's that it's an, a hyper-focus on the, um, on the efficient, what it does. Let me, I want to, um, Feel free to come back to anything we've talked about, but I have a question. You know, one of the things that's striking, I've been thinking about this lately, is, so Jeff, you and I are around the same age. For us, it kind of works that Strauss opens up the possibility to belief, but in the contemporary world, secularism, I'm starting to think, is over. That where we are now is we're returning kind of to a primitive mythological man. So C.S. Lewis, the famous English writer and professor, he said once that atheism is the religion of schoolboys. And I think I'd say secularism is too. And so the way I articulate this is that, yeah, it's exactly right. It's as long as the edifice of the school exists. And we'll call the Western edifice of the school the Jewish and Christian tradition. So as long as you're inside the Jewish Christian tradition, 
that reason is good, justice is good, we're created the image of God, dignity, all these other things that we just kind of like take for granted. They're just there. We like assume them as very normal. Like to use a Lewis example, you know, we think bread comes from the baker's truck. We have no idea the sources of them. Like why, why like we don't know that the reason there's impartiality and justice in law comes back because in Leviticus, I think it's 1916 says there should be no impartiality and justice. Like we don't know that. We just take it as this is normal, right? And natural, right? And so we can be atheists in this in the edifice of the school. When the school's destroyed, which it increasingly is, because secularism, now man is no longer secular. He's thrown back onto kind of his primitive self. And so now it seems like, in a sense, the rationality that you use, Jeff, to say, oh, wait, Strauss, uh, uh, Spinoza, oh, okay, maybe more of me Orthodox Judaism is a possibility. Let me go try it out. And then you enter into a relationship with God and prayer and et cetera, which we can, I think, we hope we can talk about. Does this Straussian thing even matter anymore? Now that the, <laughs> we write, now that I mean, the, book, the book is the book is basically you know, Gen X and up, you know, you, 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 Gen Z, it's just like you, you're in a different world and uh, good luck to you. No, I <laughs> think it's good. I know. I mean, I like it. No, this is not, this is not to question. No, I'm not, I'm not no, no. The, yeah. but I mean, but what do you think though? I mean, what do you think? But my point is, I think that in a sense, like, like secularism, and atheism are still like the, the reason I think what Strauss points out is like, you know, and I'm not trying to be too harsh here, but okay, okay, goofies. Yeah, you can talk all you want, but like the reality is you're living in the school, okay? And you have running water and rebar and electricity. And so that's why you think all this stuff is natural. But when the school is destroyed, you're thrown to your primitive self. And now in a sense, like now we're in a sense almost competing no longer with atheism and secularism, but with the return to primitive religion of mythos to transhumanism that I, I've argued that the new tower of Babel is man himself. We're going to burn, burn bricks and make ourselves eternal. I mean, there's just hyper irrationality all over the place. I don't know. That's my, my sense. What, what do you think? And how does Strauss work? And maybe I'm wrong. Go ahead. I, I'll just say quickly, I don't know. Is, is my, is the, you know, I can say, I don't know in 10 more fancy ways, but the answer is, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I maybe I'm just so locked in my own paradigm of thinking about this. But when I speak, when I speak to my own inner atheist, you know, I speak to him in this language of these premises, and so I just feel like any discussion today around secularism or hyper secularism or whatever we have today sort of has to sort of start by breaking you know breaking the spell and to me the most powerful way of breaking the spell is the idea that this is not the only it seems like the only way to look at the world it is not it, it, that's an that's an accident it's not really the only way to look at the world there's an alternate interpretation of the world that is possible i mean you know I, the only other semi-coherent thought i have about what you're saying is just an idea that unfortunately i sometimes feel like you know you're not going to go to argue people out of certain things. People, life's going to have to go its course. Certain things are going to either work or not work, and people are going to have to find out for them. They're going to recreate the wheel, you know, civilization in, in, a, in a sense. Learn how to bake bread again, to use your your metaphor. Although I, I think it's hard, and I think that one of the things that's sort of hovering in the discussion here, and I want to press Rabbi Kagan and press you on it because it's a, it's a legit question I have. And I'll, 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 if I can, put it out there. And you sort of alluded to it, Michael, at the beginning of the conversation, which is that, you know, Jeff Bloom shows up and says, you know, for all kinds of reasons, my parents are divorced. Oh, so I sort of romanticize religion. And I have a kind of, I come to Judaism with a sort of predisposition to take it seriously. And then Strauss comes and he puts it on the table. Then I go off to Yeshiva and here I am, Orthodox. I'll, you know, there I am. There's a lot of people who their, their stories are very different. They had very negative experiences with religion. And, you know, if someone comes and says, look, well, my experience of the world is very, very different. I don't romanticize Orthodox religion or Orthodox Catholicism. I, in fact, do the exact opposite of it. I'm going to write a memoir as I, you know, slam the door behind me. You know, there is, how do we, you know, it seems like we've just got to, there's a lot of, subjective, you know, 
I've got my subjective take on the world. This is how, this is my truth, quote unquote, my truth. And someone else could have another truth. And I, I find that to be a very hard question in my mind. So I'm just, I'm posing it to the two of you. You know, what, how do you come at that? Robert Kagan, you want to, you want to. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I just, I mean, the one thing I, I would add in is uh, I don't really think you can convince anybody of anything that they don't want to believe. Someone who is uh, deeply rooted in the way that they're looking at the world. I don't think there's anything you can say to them that's going to get them to change. But there are people that aren't so deeply rooted or are open to uh, a more expansive way of viewing the world. And for people like that, the conversation still goes through argument. It doesn't, it, argument and explanation. This ability to discuss, communicate, describe accurately, argue, or, I mean, again, argue not in the sense necessarily proving, but proving the viability of a way of looking at the world remains incredibly valuable, even in the world that we're living in. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think that's right. So, you know, that actually brings you to this a chapter by um, Moshe Kapel called Why Revelation But Not Orbiting Teapots, which is a really, it's actually a really good essay. It's really short and, and really good. So he starts out, for listeners, he starts out uh, where he says, I'm going to summarize uh, Strauss's argument uh, using television. And so he, he creates a conversation between himself and, and someone else and um, about Superman. And so he says, you know, you know, the crime's low in, in Metropolis. Why? And uh, you say, well, don't tell anybody, but I know the real reason. And he says, well, why? Well, it's Clark Kent. You know, Clark Kent actually has all these superpowers. And he says, okay, that's great. But the guy was just arrested the other day and Clark Kent was over by the Daily Planet. And he says, that's my point. I mean, Clark Kent can remove his glasses. He's like faster than a speeding bullet. He's like, okay, yeah, whatever. But I mean, whoever the, the guy who caught... Muggsy, the criminal, he knocked down a cement wall, which requires heavy machinery. And Clark Kent doesn't have heavy machinery. He goes, well, his Superman doesn't need heavy machinery, right? He can, he's more powerful than a locomotive. Okay. Yeah. But it's far away. I mean, you have to be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. He goes, guess what? Clark Kent, you know, that's what Superman can do. And he's like, and he says, at some point you realize you won't persuade me. And the reason you won't persuade me is not that there's a demonstrable flaw in your argument. You've got the angles covered. The real problem is I just don't believe that Superman exists, right? He said, and then he, I, I love this line. He says, the point is perfectly clear, but let's make, let's give it some academic gravitas by making it more obscure, <laughs> uh, which is hilarious. But anyway, he go, he kind of goes through and he's making this point. Like, I think this goes to your, the first part is that some, if you, if people don't, aren't going to believe they're absolutely not going to believe. And they think of the existence of God as Superman. It's just completely outside their realm. But I think one thing, yeah. and this, so that's the first, like relates to the first part. But the second part of your, your point, Rabbi Kagan, was I think that you're, if I understood you, we still need to make these kind of reasoned arguments because there's something deeper there. And I think what, what Moshe Kapel does is he actually makes a distinction between certain beliefs like, you know, teapots orbiting the sun or that the great pumpkin will show up. And he says, well, actually the claim that God exists and that he revealed himself to us is a very much more profoundly rich, deep claim than Superman or orbiting teapots. It's a completely different level of being. And I think this goes back to your engagement of being question. And I think it goes back also to the Straussian plausibility that opening up the question that there are premises. And so, I mean, maybe Jeff, you can go through the, I don't want to go through the whole essay, but maybe you can kind of address this, that, that there, all these assumptions, he says, about Moshe Kapel says, there are only a few of the most obvious assumptions that we make for the conversation about truth ethics that you can get us off the ground. There are many more assumptions. For example, we must assume that our actions have consequences beyond the short term, right? We believe that society that we live in will endure and give some narrative, right? We assume free will. We assume rationality. We assume all these layers of things going on. And that opens us up to a deeper discussion about God in a way that's radically different from Superman or or orbiting teapots. And I think this is like the two parts of your point, Rabbi Kagan. What, What do you think? Robert Kelly, why don't you take that one? I think if you're speaking to a person who's a psychopath, 
you don't have a lot of avenues of argument. But if you're speaking to someone who has a deep-seated instinct for morality, which is not just what I would call transcendent morality, meaning that there's such a thing as right and wrong, that's still very, very much a part of us. According to the Jewish tradition, that sense is not something which has been introduced socially, but rather it's just to the extent that a person is still integrated with that deeper divine self, then there's an instinct that there is right and that there's wrong. And in the world that we're living today, which really is as comes to this very unadulterated vision of reality as completely physical, there is no place for that. And that the real opening to sort of introduce this idea and to sort of invite people to pursue a deeper appreciation of these kinds of ideas is starting with, you know, this, these are ideas that you, without which you would not recognize yourself. Let's uh, take a look more deeply what the implications of this are. And, uh, you know, maybe it's worth, maybe it's worth uh, thinking about these things. It's that, you know, this radical sort of secular view, which is becoming increasingly accepted in the world around us, which I basically call an unadulterated expression of the basics of sort of Western outlook. And if you really take a look at the implication of that, it's a world that you yourself find absolutely unacceptable. And if it's unacceptable, if you can't recognize who you are in that world, then you need to explore the implications of these things which you hold Yeah, precious. I think, I think that's well said because I think what ultimately, what we could maybe call like, a certain type of like hard version of materialism ultimately leads to nihilism, right? Because there's no love. Yeah. Because, okay. So I mean, I think that one of the ways I explain it in very, very simple terms is, well, in that context of say hard empiricist materialism, why do you love your children? Why do you think justice is better than un- injustice? You know why? Why does is kindness matter? Why do you want to help someone who's sick? What? what n- none of these things has any point, and yet you believe it. Yet there's some kind of way of being. Yep. Uh, Thomas Aquinas did what's called. He calls it the first principle of practical reason. Says that good is to be done in pursuit, and evil is to be avoided. And that's just kind of like part of who we are. Now we can lose that in a sense. Like there's a from St. Paul's letter to the Romans says uh, uh, they did not accord God thanks, and et cetera, et cetera. And then their senseless minds were darkened. And so we can, in a sense, lose that. But I think that almost brings us into like nihilism or psychopathy, right? That there, that there's something broken. But I think, and I think, so I do, I think you're right though, in a sense, like I find, okay, one of the things I like about the Strauss argument is, and he's not the only one who does it, but this just kind of critiquing the premises, right? Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who's later became Benedict XVI, I mean, he does a lot of the same kind of work on just a critique of reason that the dominant vision of modern Western rationality is incoherent on its own terms. It doesn't give you what you want. And then in order, what the way you're actually living, not only the way you're personally living, but the, like everything that you want and desire can't be solved by this. And so there's, it's readily bifurcated. And I think this goes back to the teapot's point, right? It's one thing to believe in an orbiting teapot or Superman, the question that Orthodox Judaism gives and that Orthodox Catholicism gives, the answer is, is that there's that actually, in order for you to get all the things you want, you're relying upon something way more profound and deep and embedded and cultural that you're taking for granted. And what I think Strauss does is he, oh, that's what he did with you, Jeff. He opens up the door. And then when you engage in the practice, right? Of reading the portion, going to synagogue, saying your prayers, observing the kosher laws, right? In our case, like, you know, like fasting, in our case, like, you know, going to mass, praying, you know, several times a day, fasting, abstaining, et cetera. But then obeying the moral law, all of a sudden, like you realize then in a sense, faith begins to inform like the relation with God begins to inform actually your reason and you're able to see things in a clear way and it brings you into depth that is coherent as opposed to 
incoherent. And I think that's maybe the teapot argument that, and, and why, why this book is important. Like it opens up the door to actually say, okay, you want to debate this stuff? Let's debate it. And it, it turns out while there's in compl- incredible complexity, and we're not going to solve the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death with rational argument, that actually Orthodox Judaism is a more reasonable more philosophically coherent position than materialism or atheism because it actually aligns with the deepest held beliefs and behaviors. What do you think? When you say it like that, it brings me back to sort of my initial impulses towards orthodoxy. Because the question I've always had for myself is, you know, I, I didn't need my mother to say, you know, hey, you just some kind of crutch to lean on. You know, I, I asked myself, am I, you know, am I just attracted to this because, you know, I grew up in a certain way and I see these families and I and I want that. But, I, you know, so that's one thing I said to myself. But the counter argument I always made to myself was, is sort of but maybe the preservation of a certain kind of family life in mm-hmm. – a, in an orthodox religious home, and I, I would bet that I would see something similar in a well-run you know, orthodox Catholic home, you know, on a good day. <laughs> All our homes on a good day, but um, oh, you know, <laughs> on a good day. <laughs> okay, I'm catching these orthodox Jewish homes on, the, on, the, on yeah. Friday night on the Sabbath when everyone's more or less, uh, you know, uh, ready for game day. But uh, you know, but point being, you know, that <laughs> itself, there's a certain truth embedded in that that's an argument of a different kind that you know was speaking to a different part of my quote-unquote rationality i mean i'm a little uncomfortable with your presentation because i don't want to make and i know you wouldn't want to do it either we don't want to reduce religion to sort of getting the goods we want you know there's a there's, no yeah of course there's obviously no. transcending of getting the goods we want and and but anyway that, that's Ray kagan what did what, what i just jumped out can, of you. Go can ahead. I jump in? Sorry, yeah. one one thing, just real quick before Rabbi King jumps in, because you made an important point, Jeff. I just want to address it, just because it's so important. I don't want to let it go. Yeah, it's not instrumentally getting the goods you want. What I was saying was that the deepest things that we believe and want and desire, like that are part of the way we live and what we desire and what we hope for, are more coherently aligned with Orthodox Jewish or Orthodox Catholic belief than they are with the materialist worldview. That's what I was saying. Now, on to this question, which we can, I, I'm going to ask you about Judaism in a minute. Sure, sure. But I mean, the reality is suffering is part of this life. And suffering is, in fact, part of the the life of the Jew and the Catholic. So yet, today's June 2nd. I don't know when this will come out. But yesterday was the Feast of Justin Martyr. He's a very early martyr. And there's a dialogue of his discussion with the Roman emperor. Right? Are you going to obey? Are you going to okay? Get to the point, the prefect. Are you going to sacrifice the gods or not? He's like, no. I, I, it's. I'm not going to stoop down. He actually uses reason because he was a philosopher. I'm, it's irrational and, and bad wrong for me to stoop down to sacrifice to idols. And then, okay, what about the rest of you? We're Christians. We don't sacrifice to idols. Well, where do you think the Christians got not sacrificing to idols? They got it directly from Jews. Jews and Christians don't sacrifice to idols. Okay. And so you think of, you know, uh, I think her, I think that Talmud gives her her name, Hannah. Hannah. She's, uh, you know, the mother of the seven sons. All the sons die, right? The Maccabees. All, the mother stands strong. She's killed. Suffering is part of this. And then there's also suffering of the denial to yourself. Right there's part of Jewish that, that I know and Catholic practice is you're actually denying yourself, you're suffering, you're obeying, you're following, the, you're you're and and in, but in that obedience comes joy, but joy can't be grasped. It's not a utilitarian thing; it's the fruit of a love relationship. And so, yeah, I absolutely want to make sure that you know. Yes, okay. If you said to me, following you, Jeff, and I'm, I'm going on just for a little bit long, sorry. You know, what kind of life? What do you want? Well, you want a happy married life where the parents stay together and why? Because marriage is better than divorce, right? Why is marriage better than divorce, right? Why, why is family better than non-family? Why is justice? Why is kindness to one another? Why is charity and kindness and patience in the family better than non-kindness, charity, and patience? Why is it better to nourish and try to love your wife and your children than it is to just do whatever you want? Yeah, you're going to be a lot happier, Okay. You're also maybe going to have to die to yourself and suffer and give in, in in certain ways. So the reason is not because you're going to be happier. The reason is because it's good, true, and beautiful. And then the happiness comes. I, I think that I just, yeah, I agree with you. It's not a simple, like, it's not a utilitarian calculus. That, that, yeah, I, I knew you didn't mean that, but I just think people could hear it so, that way. Oh, no, so. great. Yeah. 
No, I'm so glad you brought it up. Absolutely. No, I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's, and this kind of goes back to Rabbi Kagan's point. I mean, the reality is we live in Western limited rationality society and we tend to look at like uh, uh, instrumentalism. And so the reason you should become Orthodox Jew is because you're going to, you know, uh, be happier and make more money. Like, no, you might actually be worse, unhappy, et cetera, but you will be living according to the truth and the commandments. And that alone, it, it's, you know, St. Bede, his, he was a, a Benedict and he said, it's better to be stupid with love than to be the greatest scholar and have no love in your heart, right? So it's better to be, you know, I think poor and obey the commandments uh, than it is and, and suffer than it is to otherwise. But that doesn't mean it's easy in any way, shape, or form, right? And so I think I think getting that, in a sense, tension is part, like the dying to yourself is, is really an important thing we don't want to neglect. But sorry, I, I went on a little long. Go ahead, Rabbi Kagan, you wanted to jump in? I think there's two distinct uh, levels of argument, if you want to put it that way, that, uh, you know, there's uh, the whole point of, if you want to call it a faith-based system, is that we recognize that there is a deeper reality and that the physical world we live in is nothing more than the expression of that deeper reality. There are ways that you can live where your physical actions and experience resonate with this deeper truth and that uh, living in that way is... I don't know exactly what term you want to use, successful or, uh, but I, I think that I, I, the main point is I think that you're able to develop yourself as a person on a whole different level if the way that you're living your life and you're acting is in resonance and consonance with that deeper truth. They sort of that, and you, and I, I that, but I, I am a little bit uh, as, as a shtickle, as we'd say, intellectual. I lean more towards a, a different level of argument where I'm trying to – I'm not trying to bring a proof from experience so much as uh, I'm trying to un, – I, I want to sort of understand things just sort of for what they are. I don't know what term you want to use, but I guess that when you talk about living with these deeper truths, this gets back to the point that I was making before in terms of the experience of being as opposed to sort of living in the world as a functioning thing. I think when a person – deepens their engagement of who and what they are, what we would call these inalienable, I mean, the, it, what we would call inalienable truths become increasingly clear. I mean, I use the terminology, there's such a thing as objective subjectivity, which is that you can experience yourself in a very superficial way, in which case your experience is not really indicative of any deeper truth of reality whatsoever. But we can develop ourselves to the point where we engage our, who we truly are. The more deeply we root ourselves in that, there are certain things become clearer and clearer and clearer. You use the term of love a lot, whatever, whatever, or uh, you know, creativity, giving. There's there's truth. There are many many different uh, terms that we would connect onto. But the the point that these things become integral to our identification of who and what we are, that's where you have access to a truth that comes through the experience of being as opposed to um, rationally trying to analyze or understand the world, you know, strictly through the prism of human reason. In Hebrew, you have a term called dat, which is a kind of knowledge where it is so integral to who you are. The way that one of my teachers put it is, if you didn't look at the world this way, you wouldn't recognize yourself anymore meaning this is something that's deeply ultimate and on an ultimate level indistinguishable from your identification of yourself in terms of who you are. When a person deepens their experience of themselves in a way where they're winnowing out things that, uh, that aren't part of that essential self, then there are truths that become incre increasingly clear. And uh, and the path to objective subjectivity is really the window on this deeper truth, and that's a is a truth that you know we take for granted. Without if you're a healthy person spiritually at all, then the 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 value of giving, the la value of connection, the value of honoring people, all these things is something that we intuitively accept. But if we look at them more deeply, it's not just intuitive; it's actually something which is inseparable from our awareness and concept of who and what we are and what is real. And that uh, if you're looking for, uh, you know, we talked about the difference between faith and reason, the thing that we know more than anything else is our own existence. And when we come to familiarize ourselves with 
that existence, that existence has content to it. And the, as a result of which we look at faith as not as a weaker form of understanding the world, but it's actually even more stronger. It's even much stronger than what we would call the compelling logic of reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you say in your essay, um, as you're talking about this understanding of dot and understanding, it, it, uh, the integration of self with understanding that we are describing achieves a much more profound connection to the truth than, quote, the binding power of the known, which Strauss attributes to philosophical truth. Strauss's binding power refers to the sense of externally grounded necessity inherent in logical deduction. The Torah allows us to go beyond this. With Torah, one can be the veracity of God's existence where it is inextricably bound up in our experience of being, the gateway to God, who is the ground of all being. And so I think there's an openness that's actually well put. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who said that. It was beautifully read. So uh, I just summarized you. I summarized you by using you to summarize yourself. Okay, that's what I did. So actually, this is a, another. A, I want. I actually have a question. I want to make sure I get to about Shalom Karmi's essay. I want to ask you about. It, so I don't, I don't want to forget this. But uh, I think this question, like a, this, is a kind of an existential thing. It's not. But I had a conversation with someone the other day, and we were talking about in a sense, what is the, how do you engage reality? And it seems to me, uh, without overstating it, that maybe the foundational way to engage reality is to have, an, has, have the spirit of gratitude. That you're, in a sense, and let's pause for a second, it's easy for me to say that. Okay, it's easy for me to talk about how grateful I am. I admit that. Like, I, I'm blessed. I have an easy life. Okay? And if some people have a very, very hard terrible life. They're abused and justice, et cetera. So I, I have that sense. But I think still in a, in a sense, there's a sense of kind of gratitude that I get to be here and I get to experience this place and I get to knowledge and openness. And that gratitude, I think, opens you up to this being that you're talking about, Rabbi Kagan, of it's in a sense the foundational element to be able to see the world, which is different from maybe what you'd call the Western rational modern view, which is an, a manipulation of reality. So it doesn't mean that we don't complete creation. That's what we're talking about. But that a certain openness to being, and again, this goes maybe back to your book, the point of your book, that Strauss, Strauss is p- creating the plausibility of Orthodox Judaism it also creates the plausibility that gratitude and a reverence before being is actually philosophically a possibility as well. What do you think? Yeah, about that? I, I, if I can jump in on that, I think that that's beautifully put. And I think if I were to stitch that together with something that that Rabbi Kagan says in his essay, the idea that the path of being runs through character. What does that? What does it? What does he mean? When he says that, I think what he say it again. The, the path, path again, being say it again. runs through character. So, so character doesn't mean be, being. I mean, it means being a good person. But when you talk about gratitude that way, you know, it's sort of like the kind of the foundational algorithm of the universe, so to speak. You know, meaning if I'm in a state of gratitude, that means that I'm understanding that my existence, the world's existence, everything around me is coming as a gift. There's a giver. It's not neutral. It's not just stuff that's floating around me. It's a communication. When I give a gift, there's a communication between, you know, if, if I give my wife a, a pair of earrings, it's a communication of love between me and, and, and my wife. If God gives me this gift of being and this gift of this amazing rich world to participate in, then it's a gift. And, and, and it might be that if I work on being a giver in my own life, I might be more sensitive. That algorithm might resonate with me. I might be more prone to see, you know, I see on the outside what I am on the inside. And I I project if if what I am on the inside is a giver, then I might see the world, I might be more prone to see the world as a gift and have that sort of vibrate, you know, inside me. Is that, Rabbi Kane, does that sound familiar to anything that, in your books or your essays? 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, there's the, the language that the commentaries use is that I can connect to God by making myself a branch from his tree. So if I understand that uh, the God's relationship to the world on the most basic level is he's a giver. And uh, so this is uh, effectively uh, the, only, the, the first, the foundation of any perception of God or relationship with God is that he's a giver. And the way that I, I don't merely acknowledge it, but I can actually become connected to it is by making myself a giver. That's for sure true. The one thing that I would add, which takes us to another level, is the ultimate emulation where I become a branch after the tree is not actually in giving, but actually in creating and choosing. That would take the discussion to a whole nother level. I don't know if that, I don't think that's necessarily <laughs> what we want to do right now. But if the, the whole point is, if I'm trying to, the primary mode that we use for, I mean, there are different ways. There's, uh, I can connect to this larger reality by minimizing myself so that I disappear as a distinct entity. That's one form of connection. The form of connection is, is that I uh, become an emulator. And the ultimate emulation is this, uh, the one thing that the physical world we live in as a physical world, everything is determined. The fact that there's a possibility for anything not being determined requires us to step out of the confines of this physical world, which is defining reality in this modern Western intellectual and philosophical mode, which is one of the reasons why uh, many philosophers will deny the reality of free will, because free will means I can actually do a creative act, something which, which I initiate, which isn't a consequence of something that came before me. But ultimately, we understand the ability to actually choose, meaning to initiate, is can only be understood as a divine quality that we share. And ultimately, the, it's through that, it's through the, our acts of initiation, which really means defining our actions, defining ourselves, that allow us to emulate on the most profound level. So, um, you know, these are, they're all different. These are all different elements in our toolbox of connection. You can, we can talk about the sense of, of self-effacement. We can talk about character emulation, and we can talk about becoming creators in our own right. They're all different ways of resonating, connecting, or uh, disappearing into. But I think, uh, I think the point of gratitude is, I'm just saying that the, your point of gratitude is the foundation for the awareness of the fact that there is something other than myself. And without that, that you can't go anywhere. If I could just throw one sentence on top of what Rabbi Kagan said, I think he's alluding to this, there's a sort of ongoing at least in my studies of Judaism, where the, the sort of the role of the self becomes this very complex thing. Because on one hand, it's the you know arrogance and pride and selfishness are the, these boogeymen, and they take you away from God and they block God, and um, you know therefore there's a big effort in religious life to of self-effacement of removing the self of getting past the self of getting of tra of transcending the self and yet sort of you know when you get to the end of the rainbow you find out there's the you know ray kagan's metaphor of a, of a branch and, and that metaphor of the branch to the tree so the branch is nullified with respect to the tree and yet the branch is important for what comes after the branch it has an identity an, an independent identity for what it gives forward onto after itself so that then there's a role for the self i'm just saying that you know and i'm not i'm abstaining the question not giving any answers that there's sort of this you know the self is a paradox you know you it, it's bad and it's good <laughs> end of ted talk thank you i think it's interesting the point about choice i mean we maybe we don't have time to go too much into it but <clears throat> choice and <clears throat> self gift and creation and freedom, because this goes to this question of the image of God. What does it mean to be in the image of God? I think Rabbi Kagan, you write about it, and so does uh, so do several others. That the so the that I think again. I mean, I'm trying to kind of branch two things over because I'm kind of connecting it back to the Strauss Spinoza element. That the gratitude, as we talked about, gives you that foundational, element. and then you realize that there's there's like you exist because somebody else did something for you. And I mean, like, as you probably know, like Thomas Aquinas in the five proofs of God's existence, one of them has to do with contingency, that we're contingent. We could have been otherwise and we're dependent. And that means someone had to bring us into existence. But not only that, we're so contingent, we have to be held into existence right now. 
because we can't hold ourselves into existence, which means, okay, and he says, right, is it the angels? Well, maybe not. Okay. Somebody's holding them. And, well, this can't go on forever, infinite regress. And at some point, God is holding us all in existence, right? And that sense of gratitude that opens up, oh, I, I exist because of something else. And then, but I think also the other point from the side is like, now I have to do something. I have to be a giver. I have to create. I have self-choice. I have to choose. And I think this tension of the self, of course, is, I mean, this is like very complex and deep, but like, what does it mean that we're creating the image of God and that we have this ability and that ability to choose and create can also be used for destruction, for self-aggrandizement, to try to become like God, you know, we're going to grasp the Tower of Babel, burn bricks, make a name for ourselves, or grasp the fruit. There's this tension. And I think, I'm not sure who wrote about it in, in the, um, maybe it was Gil student, but Moses comes up as the model of humility. So Moses, because he, in one sense, he's self-effacing. And the other thing, he's the greatest because he properly orients himself to like where where you are in the world. And so I think this is another, maybe this is a slightly off topic, but I think that you feel free to, to um, critique this. But I think as I think about, hey, listen to Rabbi Kagan talking, maybe one of the things that maybe is bothersome about religion, and it goes even to one of the essays about, which I, I actually don't know this. I didn't, I didn't have time to go to that essay on the, the um, on Spinoza as the, um, the, you know, kind of proud, like a destroyed intellect through pr his pride is that there's a sense in the atheistic tradition, the enlightenment tradition, that somehow God takes something away from us. That in order for us to be free, at least whether you see this like in Feuerbach or whatever, we have to wrestle back, like Judaism, and, and I'll say Judaism and Catholicism and all the laws and all the regulations and all the restrictions, they take something away from us and they do violence to our, our self. And when we begin to go deeper into what does it mean to be self-effaced and to be humble, it's in that that we actually are able to actually flourish and have a richer human personality. And part of that goes back to gratitude, that we don't make the error of Spinoza to think that the world is reduced to what we actually happen to see or happen to think. It's actually bigger than that. And we're part of something. But that human flourishing element, I think, is lost. And this goes back right to the beginning of the conversation, Jeff, when you said, you know, here I am, you know, children of divorced parents, I'm trying, and I, 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 you see order, and you want that order. And, and we've already said, that's not, you're not doing it simply, be, you don't get the order by just getting the order. You only get the order as the fruit of the love relationship, the fruit of the practice. But I think, in a sense, one of the Maybe the, like I'm talking, thinking about like modern existential questions of belief. Like, why don't people believe? Well, they don't believe maybe because of Spinoza and irrationality and and Western rationality. They don't believe because they've been hurt. They don't believe because this. They also don't believe because they don't want to lose themselves. And you have to die to yourself. But in dying to yourself and becoming humble like Moses, now you become you know, the great Moses, right? I don't know. I, I'm just, it's kind of striking. Like that's, I think, another element of the existential experience that so many say non-believers have a sense that it's somehow robbing you of yourself instead of giving you, as Rabbi Kagan said, an ability of a kind of, I, this is not exactly his words, but a flourishing, fully human self. Do you, do you want to react to that? I mean, you said a lot of things. Uh, one of the one of the things that I wanted to respond to is um, is ra th there are two levels on which you can talk about the idea of giving. Meaning, I look at if I have this sense of gratitude that I recognize there was an act of giving, and that that kind of feeds into for Aquinas a philosophical argument for the existence of God. I think the whole point is those kinds of proofs have a place as an adjunct or a beginning to a process of faith. But ultimately, the whole point is that if you become a giving person genuinely, then faith ceases to be a question that needs to be proved. Because once you experience reality at, through the mode of giving, 
then the fact that the world is given and there's a giver now becomes intuitive. I'm not saying that doesn't have to be developed on another level, but the point of gratitude as a foothold in faith on a comprehensive level is not because it leads to an intellectual proof, which is again, like uh, Descartes proving his own existence with, I think therefore I'm with an, uh, with an, but ultimately if you are a giver and you understand and experience reality as giving and a given reality, then Imuna is an integral basis of your whole understanding of both yourself and reality. And that ultimately the, that's that where we really started. And the point that I'm trying to make in the, in the essay that Imuna is not a weaker form of knowing something to a cult weaker than the compulsion of rational intellect, but rather it's actually something more powerful because what we know more than anything else is our own existence. And when that existence itself echoes the idea of creation or a deeper existence, then faith is no longer an intellectual act through a proof, but it is integral to my experience of self and awareness of self. Okay, no, that's good. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that either when you have faith, you do have a different kind of knowing and it is different. It's not, um, it doesn't fit maybe empirical knowing, but, and this actually goes to the point, em empirical knowing requires a different kind of knowing. So I would say it's actually the deepest empirical knowing because it actually is a part of your awareness of self, as opposed to stepping out of who you are into the mode of intellect, which is a part of the confusion is, a, and this goes back to the Greeks, is the Greeks compared, actually conflated thought, intellectual thought with the actual person themselves. And that the, uh, so if you think something, uh, then you yourself are it, but we don't really relate to reality that way. And that's not really the, all the, all these uh, monotheistic systems are coming from a completely different place. Faith we see as a tool. It's not the self. It is a tool of the self. So if I'm coming to knowledge through intellect for us, that is outside the self as opposed to the self. That's why I'm saying that uh, for the Greeks, that may have been the self because that's because that was really the way they looked at things. That's the way they experienced themselves. But that's it's, that's not our experience, and it's certainly not the origins of any of these monotheistic faiths. So the whole point is that in, faith is more is actually more compelling than intellectual proof because it actually is an integral basis of your very awareness of self. That's what we're trying to get to. And the, what we call about sort of developing faith is really developing that deeper familiarity with yourself and those aspects of self, which are a consequence of the fact that the world is a cre the created world, that we exist in a larger context, what you're calling the importance of gratitude. And that, that that's not opposed to or somehow undermining of, of the other part of reason, but that, that faith and reason... Uh, in the language of John Paul II, are the two wings which rise you up into contemplation? That they're 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 working together as opposed to opposed to each other. The way Strauss, or sorry, the way the Spinoza articulates it, but also Strauss, he goes along. With that. Intellect allows you to expand your grasp on your experience of being. Yeah. Okay. So can I change the subject here for a second? I want to ask you a question on Shalom Karmi's essay. So he says on page twelve of your book. Strauss assigns, he says, this is quote, an outsized place to philosophical understanding. And consequently, he gives, well, it's not really a change of subject. It's related to what we were talking about, I guess. <laughs> he gives religion an ancillary role in guiding society. He understands Maimonides and other medieval Jewish thinkers in the light of this conviction and thus seems to ratify Spinoza's categorization of Judaism as a legalistic political regimen. This, the narrow legalistic conception of Judaism influenced Kant and Mendelssohn. And he says, and he goes on to it, he says, it is wrong epistemologically because contemporary believers cannot decide to obey God on political grounds. And it's wrong on substance because Judaism does demand a personal connection to God and not merely acquiescence with his law. Okay. So as a Catholic reader, I was reading this and I'm noting this legalistic reading seems to me as an Orthodox Catholic, completely wrong understanding of Judaism and the Mosaic law. And that's the idea. So there's a tension because he says later that Jews happen to have a law that separates them from others. And they're a stubborn lot, take away their laws and abrogate their circumcision. And you will see them become like everyone else. Okay. So there's two things going on. One is, it seems to me as a non-Jew, this completely misses understanding the, the understanding of law and the Mosaic law in, in the 
relationship to God. And at the same time, yes, if you take away the law, then they will become like everybody else. Because the law is not simply just a legalistic thing to separate you, but it has to do with actually your point of how you engage being and training you to be a human being so that you learn to live like a human being and not like a lower animal. And then the tension between us is we either want to become like God or we want to live like the lower animals. And what the law is, a gift, right? It's like Psalm 118 says it's a mercy, it's a gift for us to be able to like know how to live well. And that this kind of legalistic reading of Judaism, and that's kind of irrational, God just gave us the law and we just obey it, and there's no, no reason behind it, seems to me, as an outsider, just a wrong reading. Do you want to talk about that? Maybe, what do you think? It's like a it's like a huge honey pot. I know a can of worms honey pot, Pandora's, Pandora's, Pandora's box, whatever you want. But I'd rather let Rabbi Kagan open it up and and, and see what's in there. So all all I did was ask a question of Judaism and the law. That's it. It was a simple question. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> I mean, there's a, 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 a I mean, there's a lot of different levels on which one can answer this question. Um, I think the point that you're making is certainly a valid one that the whole point of these laws is these are the actions. I mean, the way I put it to my students is that uh, if your soul was making decisions, these are the things you would be doing. The law looks to us, we don't necessarily understand it because it's actually an expression of an aspect of self that we uh, may or may not be aware of in touch with or consciously consciously know. But that... uh, Going back to the, what we were saying before in terms of the idea of developing the self as a giver so you come in contact with the givenness of the world, you can understand the law as an extension of that idea that through following the law, we become beings that are expressions of that deeper self. And as we become more integrated into it, this becomes our identity. That's what I was saying before also about the idea. Immuna is something that develops naturally as you make yourself a giving person because you've begun to resonate with the givenness of the world, the fact that the world is given and therefore there must be a giver. That will be true in a more, a much more detailed way when you talk about the law generally. That would be one legitimate approach to the relationship with law. We don't look at the law as a distinct thing from that developing self in context with, in, 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 in connection with God. The name that we would cite who says this explicitly is Ruth Dessler who is a, uh, a fairly modern, but the, I think we could find many sources that would say along this lines. Again, when you're talking about the, the relationship with the law, there are a number of different ways of approaching it, but the, at least on the level that we're speaking about it now, that's probably the clearest connection that we can make with it. You know, so I, I, it's like, it's like I, the way I say to my students is if, if I saw a cow walking down the street, I would think steak because I'm basically a very physical person. But if I was a spiritually developed person, if, if Abraham would see a cow walking down the street, he'd be, uh, you know, think about the Torah scroll you could make out of that baby, you know, or, or you might think be thinking about uh, a, 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 uh, an offering that one could make with it. If you are an integrated spiritual being, then you see the world through the lens of spirituality. If you're a physical being, you see the world through the lens of physicality. And the idea of Torah and the law in general is to be part of that process of developing yourself from a physical being to a spiritual being, a spiritually centered being, right. I would yeah. say. And you by, by just you don't mean spiritual in a sense of like you escape the body, but that you're integrated. It, is that question, is that... A human being can only exist as an integration of the right, two. Right, right. So, so is that deeper self then, in a sense, the image? Like fully attaining the image that's broken or lost or like, like, like in Catholicism, like you, you'd have generally, this is broad, but generally you have this sense of, you have image and likeness, likeness is lost at the fall. And in and again, this is Catholic theology, but in the incarnation, the resurrection, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, where now uh, Gentiles, it's just for Gentiles, but also just are are brought into the covenant, and then we're we're in a sense through baptism and faith, we're given the, the likeness, and then we're in a process of in a sense realizing that deeper self, right? To in a sense be who we are made to be. That's broken through sin and disobedience. When you say that deeper self, does that relate to the image of God or likeness, or how, how would you put that theologically? There's a lot of different levels. When you use the term image, from a Torah perspective, there are many, many different levels to it. There is a level on which, yeah, that's effectively, I'm moving myself in that direction of becoming more 
of becoming more and more integrated with there's a certain complexity here that I, I would sure. prefer not to go into, but the, uh, you know, the deeper levels of image remain just, it's an image. It's not the, you know, there's God himself. And, uh, and then there's to the extent that we experience ourselves as distinct individuals, we aren't that we are the image of it, but it's a very different, and the whole connection between the identity of self and this particular thing would be, would, would require some unpacking to really get to it. So it's a, I don't, I don't know if this is exactly the form no, in which good. to take it to that level. Okay, no, that's fine. I just wanted to just do it quickly. Okay, Jeff, we probably, tur- we've spent a lot of time. I'm very grateful to both of you and Robin Kagan, you're in Israel, so it's getting late there for you. Uh, so thank you for your time. Jeff, do you want to follow up on a couple, like maybe big picture things? And there's so many things we could discuss, but I think maybe why don't you give some, uh, start us closing us off here with a couple of summaries or some of the key things that well, you'd like to well, you I, I, really want. You know, I, I just, I, I appreciate the conversation so much. And I, and, I, and in, in a way, this conversation is fulfilling in my introduction. You know, I say that one of the, you know, I've got a couple, you know, I had my question I wanted to get answered. I'm putting out to a bunch of people who I think can plausibly answer, but I also had some ulterior motives. One was I one was a kind of intra Jewish ulterior motive that I felt like, you know, us Orthodox Jews, we have a lot of we have a lot of conversations that are very inside baseball for us, but you know, and we should do better to, you know, really examine our own premises and and, and have that conversation. But another thing I wanted to do have a conversation that could be accessible for people outside of our our world, you know, outside of the world of Orthodox Judaism. And, you know, because I, I had an intuition, I wasn't sure, did we have something to say to other, you know, serious believers that is useful for them? You know, because I want, you know, we're obviously, we're, you know, we're in different faith communities re- related by or their origins, have their, their similarities, their differences, their long you know, complex history, all that. But the point is, I think, kind of facing somewhat similar, you know, uh, challenges as we sort of encounter the secular world and its sort of intense modern formulation. And, you know, thought, I had this hope that we would have something to say. And it, and it is, I mean, I'm just, I'm grateful for, you know, the chance to come on and talk with you and, 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 and communicate with your audience implies that maybe that's, that ulterior motive was, it wasn't, you know, hallucinating, uh, you know, when I had, when I, you know, from that perspective, that there was something there that we, you know, could bring out that would be useful to others. So I'm, I'm just glad for that. No, well, thank you. I mean, I think it's very useful. I mean, I think it's really, relevant to believers uh, who take faith very seriously, who take revelation very seriously. And the world is telling us that that's irrational. And I think this wrestling with the question, and I, but I, I also, I really liked, I mean, I both, I liked the framing of the problem, right? That I think that how do we, is faith plausible? But I also liked the critiques I thought that was really beneficial because I think, you know, I mean, as a Catholic, I know like we would say, well, here's five problems, you know, with Strauss and Spinoza's argument. And this is what a lot of the, every, almost every single um, uh, contributor does the same thing. Like, okay, here. And I I liked that because I think it showed a double value of we're going to A, engage the big problem from say the, the the kind of secular atheist enlightenment critique, but we're also going to critique the critique. And we're going to bring it deeper down. And I think that is both helpful, just I think in in really even taking this question of belief more seriously and then what the implications are. So yeah, I thought it was great. I I, I really, I, I like it. It's, it's, a, can I, can I, it's a, a, I think a relevant book. So thank you for doing can it. I, can I, if I could throw in one other footnote that we didn't talk about because we really focused on the meat of the, of some of the arguments, but you know, this is sort of a, a meta point by making my introduction. I want to just sort of, put it out here also is that I feel that, you know, if you're a person who thinks that, you know, there might be social problems that exist today that would be helped if there was some sort of renewal of traditional religious values. Now, a lot of people don't believe that. Most, there'd be a whole group of people would say they think the problem in the world is traditional religious values. But if you're on the other side of that question and you think that the world would be a better place if there was a renewal of traditional religious values. I feel like a lot of social conservative 
commentary around that sort of ends at a point that is is not really helpful if I'm going to be blunt about it. Just to say that, you know, we need a revival of, you know, what was us and we need a revival, but how do we get a revival in a, of anything in a world that is so underwater with certain premises that are just so powerful? That I feel there's, there's sort of a bridge thinking that has to happen. The book is an attempt to, you know, contribute to that. I'm not the only one, but I feel like there's not a ton of it out there. I mentioned a few in, in the, my introduction. I mentioned Russ Duthat had a, had a column that sort of attempted to do that. And it was interesting because that column, someone popped up, an essayist who I, who I admire said, who, you know, said, why are we even talking about it? He was like, probably this is, why are we even talking about the, the, the disproven religion? Why are we talking? You know, why is Russ Duthat trying to proselytize, you know, religion to us when we the Enlightenment has debunked it? You know, and I think that's the conversation. So anyway. Yeah. I think this is just really, just really quickly, like you think a lot of the modern atheists, the idea that religion is debunked, it's sophomoric, it's not serious. And that's why I think, and, and the book is, it's not to beat you over the head with that, but to say, okay, let's actually discuss what's going on. And this is some of the things Rabbi Kagan talked about and how we actually engage being and what it means. And I, thought, I, I, I like how it was said, like it opens up a lot of questions. As Rabbi Kagan writes, it carves out space for the Torah. We need to do a lot more than that, but at least it carves out space for the Torah. It carves out space for, for belief and for discussion. And, and I think it's relevant to all the things you said, Jeff, about social concerns. Like why, why do these things matter? And again, the, I also think this is outside, maybe we can't go into it. Obviously, we don't have time, but we always have a technical solution to the problems of evil, sin, and suffering, and death. And what Orthodox Judaism gives us, it's not a technical solution to the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death. It's a different, a completely different mode, right? It's of how we are in relationship with God, and then the fruits of these things are order, right? And beauty, and goodness, right? And repentance, and humility, and all these things, right? But it's not a technical solution. And I think that's it also opens up the question beyond techne into actual engagement with being. And I think that's relevant, not just to Orthodox Jews, but to Catholics uh, and and, and uh, Christians across the board. Right, Kagan, I'm sorry. I, I jumped, I gobbled up all the closing. Uh, go ahead, right, Kagan, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, I just, I mean, I guess I, in, in a discussion like this, I shy away from any discussion of revelation because I think what we're really interested in is the step before that, which is that, you know, uh, whether a person is going to move towards a, a system where they accept revelation or don't accept revelation, there's a prior step in the world that we're living in, which is, do I have a question that, that needs to be answered? Is there an opening, you know, for a recognition of a source to existence itself? And if you, uh, you know, we were talking about the idea of someone, if you have a, 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 a deep sense for morality and that that, uh, if you explore that and that brings you to uh the, some kind of compelling awareness that there is kind of source, then already you can start asking the next question, okay, where do I take it from here? But the first step is to be asking these questions that uh, that really confront all of us necessarily, uh, but we just never really pursue them at all. So if you don't take that first step, then uh, then there's really, the, you're never going to get any place, any, you're not going to get any further along you're not getting any further along. And at least the discussion, a lot of Strauss's question asks on, on a fundamental level, just sort of, is it possible to believe in God, really? I think more than anything else, that's what the book is trying to explore. Uh, the next, that, In that sense, it's relevant. Its relevance goes uh, beyond that of the Jewish community completely. Yeah, I, I agree. And and so I guess that you well, you opened up the honeypot or the can of worms as well of like how even revelation. We'll have to, we'll have to talk about that <laughs> because in a sense, I mean, you could you know that you know, there's a line in the Catholic liturgy that says, our desire, is, this is, I'm, I'm botching it, so some cleric is going to tell me how I got it wrong, but okay, please forgive me. But it's our desire to praise you is a gift in itself, even the desire to praise you. So in a sense, the movement, like, like I think there's a sense too that you see that God is calling us. And so the openness to have this discussion, I think this, what you did, Jeff, and, and, and all your colleagues is you create the door to be able to hear the calling that it's actually plausible. Belief is plausible. And now we can begin the step. And I liked how you said earlier, like it was the, it, that opened the door to then now the steps. And I think, so I, I agree. It's just, I think it's very relevant to, to our times. And it's relevant, I think, to, to people who are believers and practitioners of the faith, because we always need to like, in a sense, be going deeper and asking the questions. And I, I, so I think it, it's very, very valuable. Michael, thank you so much. A real pleasure. 
Yeah, thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's a delight. Thanks, Rabbi Kagan and uh, and Jeff Bloom for uh, joining the Moral Imagination podcast. I will put links up to some of the things we've talked about and the book and to Kodesh Press and some of the other uh, things that we've talked about on the show notes at themoralimagination.com. Again, if you like the podcast, please do give it a five-star review and share with your friends. And thank you again for taking the time to listen to the Moral Imagination podcast. And thank you, Jeff and Rabbi, for joining. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.